Welcome to part two of our four-part series, 12 Lead EKG Acquisition and Interpretation, EKG Review. Let's be clear as to the meaning of differential diagnosis. Some EMS providers get nervous when they start thinking about creating diagnoses for people in the field as they feel they're not supposed to diagnose people. In actuality, it's okay to formulate a differential diagnosis or a field diagnosis. This is what you think is wrong with a person based on the fact pattern in front of you. You are asked to envision a following animal described with the following attributes. It's bill, it has feathers, it has webbed feet, and it likes the water. Did you visualize this animal yet? Let's recap. It has a bill, it has feathers, it has webbed feet, and it likes the water. If you guess any of the following animals, the zebra, the elephant, the tiger, or the goat, I'm sorry to say that you are incorrect. Creating a differential diagnosis means that you need to be in the ballpark. If you guessed a duck or a Canadian goose, a puffin, or even a penguin, you're within the arena. You're within the ballpark of what it could be based on the fact pattern available to you at the moment. This is a differential diagnosis list for chest pain. This is not an all-inclusive list. However, there are differential diagnoses or probabilities or possibilities that should enter the EMS provider's mind on the way to a call, during the assessment, and during the treatment of a patient. Pleurisy, costochondritis, pericarditis, myocardial contusion, muscle strain, trauma, hemothorax or pneumothorax, a hemoneumothorax, or a tension pneumothorax. This does not mean that you have completely ruled out an MI or a STEMI, but may have a lower index of suspicion based on the subjective and objective data that you obtain on scene. There are still only two ways to determine if a person is having an MI, the 12 lead EKG and laboratory values. When should you obtain a 12 lead EKG? Well, there's an old saying, you've got to hit the easy ones. Chest pain, even syncope, those are no-brainers for most providers. But consider the lift assist, the falls. Was that fall precipitated by a cardiac event? that is still evolving, dizziness, weakness, diabetics with vague complaints, or females with vague complaints, such as shoulder pain or jaw discomfort. Consider all patients who have a history of coronary artery disease, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, uh, MIs in the past, stenting in the past. This list is not all inclusive and EMS providers are encouraged to obtain a 12 lead EKG whenever they deem it necessary. So, it's not expensive, it doesn't hurt, and it only takes about three minutes. So perhaps the bigger question remains, why shouldn't or wouldn't you obtain a 12 lead on a patient? If you have the mindset to apply electrodes, then you should be applying the other six electrodes and obtain a 12 lead. The fact remains that you cannot diagnose a STEMI from a three lead EKG. Some providers feel that this is their office and they should bring the patient as soon as they can to their office so they can start treatment and assessment. I would like to contend that this is your new office. Consider it working remotely from somebody's home. You should apply the EKG at the patient's side upon arrival at the patient's residence or where they've called you, unless it creates a safety hazard for you or the patient. Waiting to get the patient to the truck may make you feel better, 
but may make you miss EKG changes that are critical to the proper diagnosis and prompt treatment of the patient. EKG may require immediate intervention before deterioration in such rhythms as sustained ventricular tachycardia, third degree heart block, or SVT. The EKG may reveal fleeting EKG changes, runs of ETAC or even runs of bradycardia. Identifying these prior to the patient being transported to the hospital may allow you to convey this information to the emergency department staff and may make a more direct line that they can travel to treat the patient's underlying condition instead of having to continue to search for it and hope that the EKG changes reappear with the HALTA monitor days later. Participants and presenters in this presentation do not endorse the use of any one particular cardiac monitor. However, you need to familiarize yourself with the capabilities of the equipment you work with daily. LifePack 15 continues to scan the 12 lead and it will print if there are any changes to the ST segment. However, it will only do so if the limb leads and bricardial leads are attached. So it's best not to disconnect those cables until care has been transferred at the receiving facility. The Zolex series has the ability to view a 12 lead EKG in real time one of two ways. Either attach to the limb leads to the patient and you will have an opportunity to view and print leads one, two, three, AVR, AVL, and AVF in 12 lead quality, or attach all 12 lead cables, and you can either view the 12 lead in real time on the screen or print for further assessment. Either way, if you have a patient who is hooked up to your monitor, you should not disconnect that until care has been transferred at the receiving facility. Providers should maintain a low threshold for the application of electrical therapy pads in critical cardiac cases. Electrical therapy may be the life-saving intervention, but it is time-sensitive in cases such as ventricular fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia, and symptomatic bradycardia or third-degree heart blocks. Think to yourself, have you ever been told there's a time and place for everything? or there's an exception to every rule? Well, here are some of the exceptions to the immediate application of a 12 lead EKG. You may see these floating around online where you Google ventricular fibrillation or asystole 12 lead EKG. You should never perform a 12 lead EKG on somebody in ventricular fibrillation. This will be recognized in any lead, including pads, the same is true with asystole, although you may need to confirm asystole in a second lead. These two rhythms require immediate resuscitative action, including high-quality CPR and possibly defibrillation for ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. You should not be wasting time getting a 12 lead during these cases. Can you identify this cardiac rhythm? You have identified this as asystole or current. There's no need to obtain a 12 lead EKG for a person in asystole, as they require immediate high quality CPR with resuscitative efforts. Asystole does require you confirm this cardiac rhythm in more than one lead to make certain it is not an equipment issue, causing a false asystole. Can you identify this cardiac rhythm? If you have identified this as ventricular fibrillation, you are correct. There is no need to obtain a 12 lead EKG for a person in ventricular fibrillation, as they require immediate high-quality CPR and resuscitative efforts. Ventricular fibrillation responds to defibrillation and high-quality CPR, along with other BLS and ALS interventions. Can you identify this cardiac rhythm? If you have identified this as ventricular tachycardia, you are correct. A person in ventricular tachycardia may be in cardiac arrest. They will require defibrillation, high-quality CPR, and other resuscitative efforts. A person in ventricular tachycardia may ha also have a pulse, and they may be stable or unstable, depending on the patient's mental status and other signs and symptoms. This will mitigate 
your course over here. Can you identify this cardiac rhythm? If you have identified this as a third degree heart block, you are correct. Third degree heart blocks usually will generate a bradycardic pulse. That is because of the intrinsic rate that is firing at the ventricles at a rate of 20 to 40. And the patient will usually be symptomatic because of the bradycardia. This may require immediate transcutaneous pacing. The patient is unstable. Let's embark on an EKG basic review. We're going to talk about electrodes, leads, electrical therapy pads, leads versus wires, EKG paper, and 12 lead EKG paper. Let's discuss electrodes, leads, and pads. Electrodes are either round or square. They have a gel diameter of approximately 16 millimeters and a silver silver chloride diameter of 10 millimeters. That is surrounded by an adhesive medium. They are available in infant, child, and adult sizes. So don't cut electrodes to fit a smaller patient. There are resting electrodes that don't have a metal clip. Instead, wires are clipped to the tab at the end. These are commonly used by clinics or emergency departments or hospitals. They last longer on the patient and they don't show up as much as the others during x-ray or other radiology. Electrodes come from the manufacturer in sealed bags. Once you open the bag, if there are electrodes left within the package, the bag should be folded over on itself and then sealed in a Ziploc bag. Open bags of electrodes are usually good for approximately 30 days after they're open. So don't preload the electrodes on the wires as this may alter the integrity of the electrodes as they dry out sitting in the back of the ambulance waiting for the next call. Leads or wires should be checked for integrity. Make sure there's no cuts or frays. And multi-purpose pads are also available in infant, child, and adult sizes. Electrical therapy may be applied including defibrillation, synchronized cardioversion, and transcutaneous pacing. To obtain a 12 lead EKG, you will need 10 electrodes and 10 leads. Regardless of your level, one of the most important things you will do as a provider is check your equipment. You need to make sure when you come on shift that you have enough paper in the cardiac monitor. You don't want the paper sticking out with a red warning line on it saying it's about to run out of paper because the last thing you want to do in front of a critical cardiac patient while you're trying to obtain a 12 lead EKG is change the monitor paper. You need to make sure the paper is loaded properly. Run a strip. Make sure that it wasn't loaded upside down. The paper in a cardiac monitor is treated and it is printed with a stylus inside of the monitor. It won't print on both sides. So you have to make sure the paper is loaded properly and you have enough. There are two pictures and one is paper that would go inside of a Zolex series, which is the folded type. And the other is rolled, which is what they use in the LifePak 15. For most cardiac monitors, the cardiac paper leaves the cardiac monitor at approximately 25 millimeters per second. But you can slow it down or speed it up if needed. Cardiac monitors do not contain ink or ink cartridges. The image is burned onto specially treated EKG paper with a stylus inside the printing assembly of the cardiac monitor. The EKG paper is divided into blocks. Left to right, is equivalent to time and up and down is amplitude. Each small block looking across the time margin is 0 0.04 seconds. Five of those blocks is 0 0.2 seconds. If you took five blocks of those five blocks, 
that would give you one second in time. Along the left margin is measured in millimeters or millivolts. Each small block is one millimeter and every five blocks is five millimeters with two large box of five being one millivolt. Again, this is a quick review for some, but a good foundation is absolutely necessary when interpreting 12 lead EKGs. 15 boxes of five small boxes is three seconds. Three seconds is delineated at the top of most EKG paper with dark hash marks. 30 boxes each containing five small boxes is six seconds. It is important to understand where your six second marks are on your strip because that is one of the ways that you'll determine the rate. So let's go through this. 15 boxes of five gives you three seconds. 30 boxes of five gives you six seconds. There are 10 six second blocks in one minute. So if we count the amount of complexes within six seconds, it looks like we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of them. Eight EKG complexes times 10 because it's 10 six second blocks per minute gives you 80 beats per minute. This is a method that is proven useful for tachycardias. If we find an R wave right on a line, every subsequent line has a corresponding number of beats per minute. 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, and then 50. So if we find the first R wave, the very next R wave we find, we're gonna see where that falls. And that's midway between 60 and 75. So 60 to 75 is 15 beats per minute. If we divide that in half, we'll get the mean of 7.5 and we'll add that to 60, which would be 67.5. So we're not gonna count half heartbeats. So we're gonna round that up to approximately 68 beats per minute. Let's try that on the strip at the top of the screen. We're gonna find the start point. The start point does not have a number. It is simply the start point. And we're gonna to go to the next box. This is 300. And the next one is 150. So this R wave falls directly between 300 and 150. And that means it's 300 beats, then 150, and between those two is 150 beats. If you divide that in half to get the mean, that will be 75 beats. If you add 75 to 150, you will get 225. You can say with a reasonable degree of certainty that this rhythm is approximately 225 beats per minute. The PR interval is measured from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS. A normal PR interval is less than 0 0.20 seconds. On the EKG paper, five very small boxes is 0 0.20 seconds. So it has to be less than that to be considered normal. A PR interval greater than or equal to 0 0.20 seconds is considered a first degree heart block. A first degree hot block in and of itself is not a rhythm. However, you would declare it was a sinus rhythm with a first degree hot block. The next segment is the QRS. Some QRS segments don't have a Q wave and only have an RS wave. However, cumulatively, it is called the QRS complex. It is representative of ventricular depolarization. A normal QRS that is what we consider to be narrow and nice, is less than or equal to 0 0.12 seconds.
One that is considered to be wide and bizarre would be greater than 0 0.12 seconds. And it would indicate that this has originated in the ventricular region versus taking a pathway from the SA node down. An example would be a premature ventricular contraction or ventricular tachycardia. The QRS complex may take on different shapes. Actually, it may not have a Q, an R, or an S, or any combo at all. Let's take this example. A normal, narrow and nice QRS complex interval is less than or equal to 0 0.12 seconds. This is indicative of the origin of the complex. A narrow QRS complex usually indicates that the source of the complex is above the atrioventricular region and is usually originating from the atrium. A wide and bizarre QRS complex is greater than 0.12 seconds. It is usually an indication that those complexes have originated in the ventricular region. The QT interval is represented from the beginning of the QRS complex to the end of the T. A normal QT interval is 0.4 to 0.44 seconds. You will notice that the P wave is representative of atrial depolarization, and the QRS is representative of ventricular depolarization. The T wave is representative of ventricular repolarization. So you may wonder why you don't see a wave representing atrial repolarization. Due to the thickness of the wall of ventricles, the amplitude of the QRS is large and masks any wave that would appear to be representative of atrial repolarization. The 12 lead EKG is usually divided up into four blocks. Sometimes there is a 10 second strip or a set of 10 second strips with one lead or two leads along the bottom. Most EMS services do not use that style of EKG reporting. Each block is 2.5 seconds in time for a total of 10 seconds worth of recording. So you may ask yourself, if a patient is undergoing a cardiac stress test, they're able to run out at a treadmill with a perfect 12 lead EKG, but a paramedic cannot obtain a 12 lead in a stationary ambulance without artifact. Why is this so? The answer is skin prep. It's important that we're not placing electrodes on dry or damaged parts of the skin. A patient's skin condition may have been altered by some of the lotions or gels that patients apply to their skin for protection or for comfort. Patient's skin may be exceptionally dry or moist or diabetic or even hairy. Good skin prep and pre-EKG instruction will yield a printed EKG which is legible. The EKG pictured above is useless. If your EKG comes out like this, Simply reintroduce skin prep, give the patient better EKG pre-instructions, and try it over again when you get a clearer picture. Electrodes use a conductive gel, and let's say it doesn't gel well with lotion. You may need to shave the areas where you apply the electrodes, or you may need to agitate the areas where you apply the electrodes. And this is best done with a two by two. Some manufacturers of electrodes send out their electrodes with a plastic backing that's designed specifically to agitate the skin. But you're probably better off maintaining the skin integrity by using a two by two. The irony of attempting to maintain good skin contact with people experiencing cardiac events is that most people that are experiencing a true cardiac event are diaphoretic and they need to be dried 
prior to the application of the EKG leads and wires. Some services use tincture benzodoin, which is very sticky and allows those electrodes to stick, but it may create a mess and try to avoid using that whenever possible. The application of electrodes, specifically the location at which they are supposed to be applied, is a source of many debates in EMS. The by the book answer is they are limb leads. They are supposed to be placed on a limb, anywhere on the limb, but not over a bony prominence. So that little bump at the end of your wrist, that's called the ulnar styloid. It's actually the end of your ulnar bone. There's also one on the thumb side, which is a radial styloid, but that's not usually prominent. Or the clavicles. Now, there are several memory aids, such as white over right, smoke over fire. So, whatever you're comfortable with, but just understand most of the leads are labeled RA, LA, RL, LL. So, that will guide you if you get into a jam and you can't remember. You will be part of a team when approaching a critical cardiac patient, and that team will work together to try to assess and treat that cardiac patient as soon as possible. Some providers will be obtaining a EKG and a 12 lead EKG, while other providers may be obtaining a blood pressure, SpO2 monitoring, and total CO2 monitoring. The arms might be utilized to try to attempt IV access. So the reality is that you may be in a situation where it is not efficient or in the patient's best interest to utilize the limb leads as true limb leads at that time. Patients who are tremless may show more artifact if you utilize limb leads for placement. Whereas patients who are belly breathing or have a significant amount of respiratory distress may prove more artifact if you utilize those limb leads on the belly or on the chest. So this is case dependent and it's not going to alter the 12 lead that greatly by utilizing either the upper arms by the deltoids or utilizing the chest or the abdomen to perform an EKG. A veteran provider once told me, work quickly, but never rush. If the electrodes are attached to a plastic multi-strip, then leave them attached until you're prepared to apply them to the patient. Some electrodes come from the manufacturer on plastic strips with perforations between each electrode. Ripping them apart at the perforations may make the wires they're attached to get tangled. And the last thing you need to deal with when you are taking care of a critically ill patient is 10 wires that are knotted together and tangled. Pericardial lead placement is very important. The greatest misconception of the placement of pericardial leads is that they are all placed and spaced equally from one another, and that's not true. That depends upon the diameter of the patient's chest. B1 and B2 are placed at the fourth intercostal space. They only need to be on either side of the sternum, so it's not more than two or three finger widths apart. After you've placed B1 and B2, find V4. V4 is placed along the midclavicular line at the fifth intercostal space. Once you find V4, simply place V3 midway between V2 and V4. On a person who is thin, the electrodes may be close. On an obese patient, they may be farther apart. Don't worry if the leads are not equally spaced. It is more important that they are in the proper location anatomically in relation to the heart. So you've placed V1, V2, V3, and V4. V6 should be placed just under the armpit at the mid axillary line at the fifth and the costal space. You will probably need to have the patient lift their arm to get into the proper spot. And if you don't have them lift their arm, you've probably put it in the wrong spot. 
D5 is placed at the interior axillary line, which is just anterior to the axillary line. A lot of providers let that line drift down, and some actually take a good image of the left upper quadrant. So don't do that. If you can't feel the ribs where you're about to place an electrode, you are in the wrong spot. This image has the pericardial leads placed properly. Note the position of V6. It's almost directly under the armpit, with V5 being just anterior. V4 is at the mid-axillary line. V1 and V2 are on either side of the sternum. They are not over the axillary line or over the nipple line. They are just one on either side of the sternum, a couple inches apart. V3 sets squarely between V2 and V4. Consider this image. What's wrong with this image? Well, V1 and V2 are abutting one another. V3, V4, V5, and V6 are simply in the wrong anatomical spot. Not to mention, if you notice, they have used three different types of electrodes for the same patient. Don't do it. This image is another example of improper electrode placement. You can see that they drift down from the line and the difference between V4 and V6 is clear in this photograph. For all the paramedics listening, the significance of V4 being in the right anatomical position should be paramount to you. As you have the ability to plurally decompress somebody with a needle at the fifth intercostal space at the anterior axillary line. So at minimum, all paramedics should be getting V4 correct. Establishing a trustful and respectful patient relationship is paramount. Anytime you expose any patient's body, there is a great deal of trust between the patient and the provider. Avoid phrases such as, I am not trying to get fresh with you. That is usually the last thing on the mind of any patient experiencing a medical emergency. If the patient's breast needs to be moved or lifted out of the way to place electrodes in the proper position, then allow the patient to cover their own breast and move it on their own. This is clearly not possible in patients who have an altered mental status or who are unable to follow commands. Always respect your patient's privacy. You have prepped the patient's skin and have applied all electrodes and leads in the proper place. Now what? Ask the patient their age. Some cardiac monitors require you to input data such as the patient's age and sex prior to pressing the acquire button or 12 lead button. Once you have acquired their age, instruct them not to speak. Ask the patient to breathe normally or not to use too much chest effort if possible while breathing. This may not be possible with critically ill patients. Assist the patient to lay back about 30 degrees. This reduces the use of accessory muscles to sit upright that can cause artifact. Ask the patient to uncross their legs and place their arms and hands by their side. Don't touch the patient. Don't let the blood pressure cough and inflate. Don't attempt to start an IV while obtaining a 12 lead EKG whenever possible. And don't attempt to perform assessments such as a neurological assessment or listen to lung sound. Let's move on to the question and answer section of this presentation. The best method to ensure that a 12 lead EKG is clear and legible is by A, applying the electrodes over a bony structure, such as a clavicle, and avoiding placing them on the limbs. B, applying a water-based lubricant to the skin prior to application of the electrodes. C, using a two by two gauze pad to wipe the skin and shave excessive hair from the area you will be placing the electrodes. D, applying the electrodes to the patient's skin first, then applying the wires. If you have chosen C, 
Use a two by two gauze pad to wipe the skin and shave excessive hair from the area you will be placing the electrodes. You are correct. A is incorrect because we don't want to apply electrodes over a bony structure such as a clavicle. B is incorrect because we never want to apply water-based lubricant to the skin. And I'm not certain why anybody would do that anyway. D is incorrect because you never want to apply the electrodes to the patient's skin first, then apply the wires because it hurts. The exception to that is if you are using resting electrodes, which are designed to apply first, then alligator clips, clip to the tabs. You have properly connected all of the EKG electrodes to a patient in an effort to obtain a 12 lead EKG. Prior to acquiring the 12 lead EKG, you should A, ask the patient their age, then after they have told you, instruct them not to speak. B, ask the patient to breathe normally or not to use too much chest effort if possible when breathing. C, assist the patient to lay back about 30 degrees. D, ask the patient to uncross their legs and place their arms and hands by their side. E, all of the above are accurate. The answer is E. All of the above are accurate. Some monitors require that you put the patient's age and sex into the monitor. So acquire that information. Then once they've told you that information, instruct them it's best if they don't speak. Breathing normally and not using too much chest effort also reduces artifacts. There are times where in critical patients, this can't be helped. Assisting the patient to lay back about 30 degrees puts the body in a relaxed position. A patient who is sitting upright is still utilizing muscles, accessory muscles underneath, and this will alter the printout and create artifact. This is also true with asking the patient to uncross their legs and place their hands and arms by their side. Once an EMS team is dispatched to a call, providers should A, talk to their partner about what they are going to eat for lunch when they get back from the call. B, consider differential diagnoses, including conditions that may be the source of the patient's chief complaint. C, wait until they arrive on scene to formulate any ideas about what may be happening on the scene. D, call to activate the cardiac catheterization team at the receiving facility. If you have answered B, consider differential diagnoses, including conditions that may be the source of the patient's chief complaint, you are correct. A is incorrect because en route to any emergency, both providers on the truck should be focused in emotionally preparing themselves and mentally preparing themselves for what they will see when they arrive on scene. C is incorrect because if you wait to arrive on scene to formulate any idea about what may be going on, you're going to find yourself emotionally and maybe even physically unprepared for the challenge ahead. D, if you call to activate a cardiac catheterization team and they do so, and that person is not experiencing a STEMI and doesn't need a cardiac catheterization team, that's probably going to end up in an unpleasant communication between the upper echelons of the hospital and your chief. It is very expensive to operate a cardiac cath team and to recall the cardiac cath team. Plus, they generally don't do it on EMS say so in Rhode Island. Although there are times where we may transmit the EKG and by confirmation, they will do so but you would never call to activate the cardiac catheterization team prior to arriving on scene. Providers should check the cardiac monitor at the beginning of their shift and make sure there are at least A, five electrodes in a full ink cartridge, B, eight electrodes and EKG paper, C, four electrodes, EKG paper, in a full ink cartridge, or D, 
10 electrodes, EKG paper, and a medical shaver. If you have answered D, 10 electrodes, EKG paper, and a medical shaver, you are correct. A is incorrect because you need at least 10 electrodes to perform one 12 lead EKG. Also, cardiac monitors do not utilize ink cartridges. B, that's incorrect for the same reason A is incorrect. That's not enough electrodes, although you would check the EKG paper. C is also incorrect because of the number of electrodes and the fact that cardiac monitors do not utilize an ink cartridge. And 10 is correct. It's the most appropriate choice. What are the proper EKG segment thresholds? A, PR, 20 millimeters, QRS, 12 millimeters, QT, 40 millimeters. B, PR, less than 0 0.2 seconds. QRS, less than or equal to 0 0.12 seconds. QT, 0 0.4 to 0 0.44 seconds. C, PR less than two seconds. QRS less than or equal to 12 seconds. QT 0 0.4 to 0 0.44 seconds. D, PR less than 0 0.2 millivolts. QRS less than or equal to 0 0.12 millivolts. QT, 0 0.4 to 0 0.44 millivolts. The answer is B. The PRR segment should be less than 0 0.2 seconds. The QRS should be less than or equal to 0 0.12 seconds. And the QT segment is equal to 0 0.4 to 0 0.44 seconds. EMS providers should acquire a 12-lead EKG, A, as soon as possible, and preferably at the patient's side upon arrival, so long as there aren't any safety concerns. B, maintaining a low threshold for acquiring a 12-lead EKG in any patient they feel may benefit from that assessment. C, as little as possible. Providers can tell if a patient is having a STEMI from a 3 lead EKG without wasting time applying extra electrodes to a patient. D, A and B only, or E, none of the above. If you have answered A and B only, you are correct. We hope that you have learned something new from part two of our presentation. Please continue on and view part three.